<laughs> okay, so I'll start by just introducing our panel chair, Professor Luis Martin Valdivieso, who earned his doctorate in education in social justice education at University um, of Massachusetts Amherst. He previously he received his license in philosophy at Pontificia Universidad, sorry, Católica de Peru in Lima City. Based on intercultural, decolonial, and critical educational approaches, his research focuses on ethnicity, gender, social class, and formal education in Peru and Latin American societies. He is in charge of courses in ethics and philosophy of education at PU. PC, CP, and his most recent book is Educación Negritude e, in, e Interculturalidad, Esayos en Tiempos de Neoliberalismo, Pandemia y Bicentenario de Perú, which was published in 2021. He has also published articles and book chapters on the educational situation of Afro-descendants and indigenous Peruvians in academic journals and publishers of Latin America and Europe. He is currently a CLAX visiting, COGOT profe COGOT visiting professor at Brown. So I'll hand over to you, Luis. Thank you, and welcome to our panelists. Good morning, everybody. F thank you, Patsy, for this introduction. So we are going to start with this panel, uh, uh, Extractivist Sectors and Challenges of, ener of Alternative Energy. I'm going to start introducing our first team of presenters, um, Richard Snyder and Lucas Gonzalez. Each uh, presenter is going to have around 15 minutes uh, for presentation, and then we are going to have time, I hope so, at the end to uh, exchange um, opinions, comments, and questions with the audience. And okay, um, <clears throat> in our first team, Lucas Gonzalez holds a PhD in political science at the University of Notre Dame. He's a researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research, and professor at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín and at the Universidad Católica Argentina. He, wa he was a postdoctoral visiting fellow at Brown University and a visiting professor at multiple institutions, including University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, uh, Australian National University in Australia, Institute of Estudos Sociales e Políticos in Brazil, Jurac um, Research in Italy, Universidad de Salamanca in Spain, he also published his book with Rowledge and wrote articles in journals, Journal of Politics, World Development, Comparative Politics, Studies in Comparative International Development, Latin American Research Review, Latin American Politics and Society, Publius, and Journal of Federalism and others. His current research interests are subnational inequality and state capacity, and the local impact of lithium extraction and the transition to the green economy. Richard Snyder, who is here, uh, is professor of political science at Brown University, where he previously served as director of the Center for Latin American Studies from 2010 to 2016. His books include um, Politics After Neoliberalism, Re-Regulation in Mexico, published by Cambridge University Press, 2001, Patient, Craft, and Method in, in Comparative Politics, 
published by John Hopkins University Press, 2007. Uh, this was uh, <coughs> a, a wrote with Gerardo Mank, uh, and was named one of the best books published in 2007 by Foreign Policy. Um, <coughs> inside Countries, there is a, another book. <laughs> uh, sorry, this is an institution. Um, this is another book, Inside Countries, Subnational Research in Comparative Politics, Cambridge University Press, 2019. Uh, wrote with Agustina Giraudi and Eduardo Moncada. Internationally, Snyder's research has been translated into Chinese, French, Korean, Persian, and Spanish, and published in Argentina, Chile, China, Colombia, France, Ireland, Mexico, Peru, South Korea, and Spain. He also co-produced the award-winning PBS documentary Ivy League Rumba, 2016, about the global spread and influence of Afro-Cuban rhymes and beats. Okay, this is our first team of presenters. Gracias, uh, Luis. Thank you, Luis. Please. I think okay. Lucas is uh, is going to lead off. Um, okay. So I'll uh, I'll turn things over. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you, Patsy and the team uh, for the invitation and for putting together the conference. Uh, thank you also for, uh, to Esther for the talk on the film. It was a um, great, uh, not only the film was wonderful, but also the conversation. And uh, there are many things we are going to be discussing uh, that are similar or have a parallel with, with the previous panel. Um, we are going to be talking about the extractive side of, of the energy transition and particularly talking about the politics of lithium extraction in South America. This is a work in progress. We have been working with Richard uh, and published two papers, a book chapter and a paper in, in uh, Latin, Latin American politics and society. And we are now working on a broader project including not only Argentina, but also Chile and Bolivia, together with some fellow colleagues who have been linked uh, to Brown. Two of them were former PhD students, Carla Alberti and Diego Diaz. They both work at the Católica in Chile. And Jose Carlos Arihuela, who was also a visiting postdoctoral fellow uh, at the CLACS. Uh, and he's now in the Católica del Perú. Uh, so we are going to be presenting some broad topics for the discussion, and we very much look forward to your reaction and comments because they will surely help us uh, with the project. Uh, let me begin by saying uh, that uh, mitigating climate change requires extraction. And among several materials that need to be extracted, lithium appears to be crucial uh, especially for storing energy in batteries. And 60% and of the world's supply of lithium is concentrated in what is called the lithium triangle, comprising the three countries, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. So here you have very remote communities, especially in the, the highlands of the Atacama Desert and the Puna, uh, who have been living uh, uh, and, and, and with their own customs uh, for centuries, mostly indigenous communities in very remote areas that have been affected sharply uh, by this extraction. So we are going to be discussing some of the threats these communities are facing and some of the opportunities that are uh, also involved in, in, in this process. We're going to be talking about extraction, industrialization, which is a key component in the debates uh, on, on this energy transition, especially whether it's possible or not for these countries to develop a domestic battery, and the scientific capacity they can also uh, put together, uh, together with extraction and industrialization. Regarding extraction, uh, extraction of lithium is, is not as visible as, as open pit mining that are huge uh, uh, projects. Uh, 
it usually involves huge amounts of water, and water that is mostly located in these three countries in uh, very arid areas, um, in one of the most arid, uh, arid areas of the world. And these uh, localities, these places, these remote areas, are populated by communities who have been relying on cattle grazing, uh, artisanal salt production, and even tourism for generations. Uh, so, of course, uh, these communities face uh, important uh, threats. Some of them are visible uh, in terms of water. Some of the rivers, this is uh, the Rio Trapiche uh, near um, Antofagasta de la Sierra, have been depleted by the local companies uh, extracting lithium. The company, Liven, the US-based company, is now uh, building a pipeline to get water from another river, the Rio Los Patos. So this is one of the visible impacts in local communities. Another one is uh, the impact to uh, the animals living in the area uh, when uh, the, the the, the pieces of lands are divided, uh, animals are killed, and of course there are uh, um, environmental disasters associated to the production, such as accidents. Uh, the last one involving a truck that transported uh, acid uh, to the plant. But on the other hand, uh, of course, companies claim that they do all they do uh, committed to sustainability. This is Liven, this is uh, Oro Cobre, another big company, producing and claiming that they are complying with sustainable development goals, even protecting vicuñas, uh, which are the main, uh, one of the main uh, representatives of the local fauna. Um, I'll finish with this uh, typology and then uh, I'll hand it over to Rich. But, uh, what we first saw is a huge variation in the uh, modes of uh, extraction, how extraction is, 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 is underway. Uh, in some cases, extraction is imposed uh, with no prior consultation to local communities, no payouts from companies, uh, no visible payouts, uh, no visible impact in terms of economic uh, or development, and no community empowerment. In some other cases, there is some negotiation with companies, uh, in some cases with prior consultation and payouts, but no community empowerment. And of course, there is some participation in, in, in very specific cases in which community is empowered. And there are many other cases in which community res communities resisted and aborted extraction. Local communities reacted, uh, in some cases violently, uh, and companies had to leave the place. So uh, in this typology, we try to present uh, the variation in the outcomes and try to come up with one of the po some of the possible explanations for that. Rich, you can continue. Did you want to say some more about extraction, or that's it, Lucas? Well, I, I'll hand it over to you. We can continue in Q&A if needed. OK. Um, well, life is full of new experiences, and I have to say this is certainly one of them. The first time, I think, ever that I've been in the, uh, I'll say it in Spanish, uh, una minoridad presencial. So most of my, the, the present minority, in other words, most of the panel is not here. <laughs> um, and including uh, the PowerPoint and control of the PowerPoint has been, uh, has migrated uh, to the global south, which you know is is fine. Um, so I'm dependent uh, on Lucas to advance the slides. Um, one other thing I wanted to to say that unfortunately, well, I'm going to have to leave before the panel's over. I have class at one. In fact, a couple of uh, my students are here, so um, so I have to leave about 15 minutes earlier. So apologies to uh, to everybody for that. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, Lucas, do you want to uh, just move forward? The, okay, so just a, we might have shown you a map at the outset so you know geographically the area of the world we're talking about. That's the lithium triangle up there. 
at the intersection of Bolivia, uh, Chile, and and Argentina's um, northwest. And you know we have this typology of modes of extraction, um, ranging from imposed, uh, including aborted, and then negotiated. Within the category of negotiated, there is compensatory and then participatory. And we have a couple of papers <clears throat> trying to explain the variation across uh, these mining projects. And what's interesting is you see a wide range of variation across projects within the same country, within the same province, so in the province of Hui, and even, you know, across very small distances. So, uh, Lucas, can you move it forward to the next slide, please? Next slide, thank you. So these are two uh, salares, or salt flats, in northwestern Argentina in the province of Jujuy. The one on the right is Salinas Grandes. The one on the left is uh, Olaros Calchari. Um, I was fortunate to, to just be up in that area in January, uh, snooping around. And let's see some, uh, some pictures. So even, these are about 40 uh, miles away from each other. So this is on the right. This is Salinas Grande. That says, even if you don't read Spanish, you probably can figure, figure that out. Uh, lithium is, is not wanted, deadly, poisonous, um, and mega minería is just large-scale mining. This says no to large-scale mining. We take care of our natural resources. Okay, So this is uh, communities in this area that are very opposed to lithium mining. And next, please. And uh, as you can see, you know, have, have mobilized... Um, well, against mining successfully. But then on the other, at the other Salar, Olaros, we have a very different situation. In this small community uh, near, so here are the, here's the one mine that's in operation for the last seven or eight years, and there's another one that's about to be in operation here. By the way, this highway runs to Chile. This is the border with Chile right here. It's an international highway, and these communities if you can block this highway, which they can, you can stop trade between Chile and Argentina and that part of the country. And it's a massive, it's like a jugular vein. So it's a, a source of a tactical power, you might say, for the, these communities. But over here in Olaros Chico, this community, this says, welcome to Olaros Chico, the host of the mining companies. Um, and, you know, I visit this community and the 400 people live there um, of those 400, and that's in total. Um, 100 adults work for the mine. And, you know, at least the folks I talk to seem uh, quite happy uh, to have the opportunity to do so. So, so there's variation, and it's a complicated uh, terrain. It's not so simple. Uh, Lucas, as you can see, here's a, a close-up of the, the statues here. And then next slide, please. Thank you. That's the entrance to this community. That's the mining uh, plant, Sales de Jujuy, nearby, which built this new uh, music uh, recital salon, uh, hall, hall. And next, please. And here's the really renovated main square. And you can't really see it too well because of the lighting, but there's a, a figure of a woman on the right and a man. And the man, of course, has a, a mining helmet on. Um, so anyway, so that, that's a big part of the project, trying to explain uh, the micro-level variation in, uh, in outcomes of, of mining projects, even at the level. And if you don't drill down or zoom down to the sub-sub-national level, that is the level of salares, salt flats, in the same jurisdictions, um, you won't see these vari this variation. Thank you. Um, next, please. And I don't know how much time we have left. Does anyone, uh, Luis Martin? Um, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So I'll just I'll just quickly say maybe let's go to the next one. Um, next slide. Yeah. Here. One more. Thanks. So our project is not just about extraction, um, and since the conference is about extraction, we're not going to say very much about the other components of it, but struggles over well, over equity, um, over how the massive profits that get made from extracting raw materials, how those profits are distributed, 
across global value chains. Those are not limited to localities. So at, at the national level, so there's international inequality as well. Um, forget international, well not forget, but as well as international inequality. And the countries, the three countries of the triangle, Bolivia, Chile, and, Ar and Argentina, um, have all uh, launched varying projects to climb up the global value chain. Um, I don't know, do we have one more slide of the value chain? No, no, back please. No, back, back, thanks, yeah. Um, so this, it turns out, as is typical, uh, with raw materials extraction is not where most of the value lies in the value chain. It lies in creating electric vehicles, in battery cells, and uh, and use applications. So the three countries have launched um, different projects to try to move into the industrialization of lithium, not just the extraction of it. And what does industrialization mean? Basically making lithium batteries. Um, the short story here is that all, di kind, all different kinds of efforts to do this um, at different scales. So in Argentina, you've had uh, provinces in, in the federal system um, launching these projects of industrialization. Um, in Chile, you have a, a very strong national development agency called CORFO, uh, Corporación de Fomento Andino, um, the Andean Development, uh, maybe I'm getting it wrong, well, CORFO. Um, and they've also uh, tried to get Chile into the game of industrializing uh, batteries, producing batteries. And the, the bottom line here is that none of these efforts have succeeded. They've all been very, they've failed for, for different reasons, so different paths of the same outcome. Um, and in terms of economics, it may not even be possible for any of the lithium triangle companies to become competitive uh, producers of lithium batteries, certainly internationally, maybe even at home, just because of the nature of that uh, of that sector, which is dominated by, by China, which produces 80% or so of the world's lithium batteries, and is in a very cost-effective and efficient way. Nevertheless, that doesn't matter to politicians. Politicians um, will, uh, will repeatedly want to proudly claim, we are going to be the first to produce the Argentine lithium battery or the Chilean lithium battery, and it seems to repeatedly fail. So we're looking at that. Um, so batteries don't work out so well. Industrialization seems to be frustrated. But there's another uh, outcome that we're looking at that is interesting. I'll end on this. Uh, Lucas, can you move forward, please? Yeah. And you may not get batteries, but in the quest to get beyond extraction, there is investment in new scientific capacity. So instead of batteries, we get centers for research. Um, not in the social sciences, my area, but so what? Uh, in chemistry, in geology, and this is exciting. It's small scale. Politicians can't get so excited about it. It's not like we're producing the first uh, Bolivian uh, battery or the first Argentine battery, but they are training new generations of scientists, and I think uh, that's interesting to pay attention to. So this is a, a center for uh, uh you know, chemistry and, and, uh, and geology in Huhui province, the same province where those two projects are located, um, that I was able to visit, and it's quite exciting. Lucas, next please. Um, you know, it's called Sid Mehu, and they're, they're in the game of knowledge production and succeeding, producing publications. Um, and also, uh, this is the director, uh, Victoria Flexer, an Argentine um, uh, chemist. And one more, please papers and so forth, and innovations in, rather than, if we think of value chains, rather than downstream, trying to compete downstream, or trying to generate what Albert Hirschman uh, called forward linkages, so if you're producing lithium, you're mining lithium, try to get into producing batteries, maybe try to get into producing electric vehicles. That may be a very daunting and maybe impossible uh, game for these countries, but upstream, or backward linkages into inputs into extraction, like better methods for filtering out lithium from the salt, that salt uh, brine that's pumped up from below. 
there may be opportunities there. And then last thing, and I'll stop here. Um, and Chile is also uh, trying to get into the game of scientific capacity building spurred by the extraction of lithium, the critical raw material, a critical raw material for the global energy transition. This is uh, the Chilean Institute of Clean Technology, which is still sort of in development, but will exist soon, I have no doubt. And as I said, industrialization may be a complicated uh, objective, and forward linkages and so forth may be difficult, but backward linkages, upstream um, dynamism, and scientific capacity building may be uh, uh, possible. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas and Michel. Now it's the turn of Mimi Scheller, who is here. She's PhD um, and is the dean of the Global School of Worcester, Worcester, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, also is an internationally recognized scholar and higher education leader with 15 years of executive leadership across academic units, research centers, and professional organizations. Uh, prior to joining uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, she was a tenure professor of sociology, head of the sociology department, and founding director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Dr. Scheller was founding co-director of the journal Mobilities, founding co-director of the Center for Mobilities at Lancaster University, England, and past president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility. She helped to establish the new mobilities paradigm and is considered a key theories of the interdisciplinary field of mobilities research and Caribbean studies. Her work has received research funding from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Science Foundation, the British Academy, and the UK Arts and Humanities Research, research Council, the MacArthur Foundation, and Mobile Life <coughs> Forum, and the Graham Foundation at Advanced Studies in Fine Arts. Dr. Scheller has published more than 150 articles and book chapters, and is the author or co-director of 15 books, including Advanced Introduction to Mobilities, and Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, uh, published by Duke University Press in 20, 2020, and she's co-producer of the documentary uh, Fly Me to the Moon. Please. Thank you. PowerPoint here. Okay, hello, thank you everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here, um, and I'm happy to join you all today. Um, I'm, I gave my title, a slightly frivolous title, Dishing the Dirt on Bauxite, um, and I'm going to be referring partly to some research I did for my book, Aluminum Dreams, The Making of Light Modernity which I started working on around 2006, um, 2007, where I intersected with Esther, who was doing her work at that point on cockpit country, and, um, and we went on to do some work together um, in terms of um, co-producing Fly Me to the Moon. And along the way, I learned some things about bauxite mining and aluminum production. And I want to say just, I mean, in reference to Richard's um, final comments in his talk, when I speak of extractive industries, I don't differentiate between the extraction moment from the ground and the rest of the industry 
all the way up to scientific production. It's all part of extractivism to me. Um, aluminum production is very energy intensive, and this is where the link to our theme of climate justice comes in. Um, it, aluminum was only um, worked out uh, in, in a sort of industrial process in 1886 it's called the Hall Haru process, and then the Bayer process for extracting alumina from bauxite ore. And it's important to think of the scale of this in terms of the, the t four to six tons of bauxite that are needed to produce one ton of aluminum, leaving behind these massive amounts of waste. The 13,500 kilowatt hours of electricity that are needed to produce one ton of aluminum, that 3% of the electricity worldwide goes to smelting of aluminum, and the carbon footprint of primary aluminum averages 16 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of aluminum in 2018. So why is aluminum important to the energy transition to you know, the future of our green, sustainable economy when it's such a heavy extractive process and demands so much energy? Well, it turns out that like lithium, aluminum is considered a key material that will, its demand set to grow massively. This is from like a recent article on metals in the energy transition, partly because it's used in the lightening of vehicles. It's an essential component in power infrastructure, solar panels, wind turbines. A decarbonized future, this article says, therefore requires an increase in global production capacity. It doesn't say we need to use less energy. It doesn't say we need to make fewer of these things. It says it requires an increase in production. Um, over the last 20 years, the production of aluminum has tripled, and it looks to keep growing, okay? And the top producers include the Chinese groups named here, the US company Alcoa, the Anglo-Australian group Rio Tinto, Russia's UC Rusal, Norway's Norsk Hydro, and India's Hidalco. That is, it's concentrated in a few very powerful, huge multinational companies that operate all over the world. Um, with China dominating the aluminum production itself. Um, so part of this increase in production, this, this, if you haven't seen, this article just came out on the 5th of March in Bloomberg News, um, mm. and it's on the ways in which electrical vehicle production is driving aluminum and bauxite demand. And they are, um, have a very deep dive report about how this is damaging the Amazon. And I think it's interesting to think about how electric vehicles are being used as the, the reason, the, the, the need that we have to electrify um, is driving this increase in bauxite mining that's incredibly damaging. And when we started uh, our, my project and uh, Nestor's project, there was actually had been a dip in aluminum production. It was actually in 2007 and then running into 2008 with the global recession that happened at that point. China stopped building so much. Bauxite mining started to fall in Jamaica. It actually closed for a little while. But what's happened is it's come roaring back in the name of the ecological transition, right? The low energy, because, because we're making Ford F-150 pickup trucks. So there's also an article out this week by Elizabeth Colbert in The New Yorker about why SUVs are still a huge environmental problem. And what you see um, here, and this is from the Bloomberg story, is the sort of supply chain, you know, from bauxite mining to alumina refining to smelting to auto parts, and the way in which that has picked up huge um, uh, momentum in the last few years. And that's what's driving the pressure on places like cockpit country. It's, it's us driving that's driving it. So just to link it back to the consumers again. So I want to just give a little bit of the history. Um, this is a Kaiser Aluminum Saturday Evening Post advertisement from 1953 of a Jamaican bauxite worker. You'll note it's very rare to actually see the bauxite workers portrayed. And this portrayal in particular, um, I'm going to speak later in, in a moment about um, a Latin American theorist who speaks about the um, body, territory, land kind of conflation. And here we see the bauxite worker's body 
conflated with the bauxite, the same reddish brown color standing like this giant on the land. Um, more typical portrayals of the bauxite industry are this postcard, which is from Suriname, which shows um, a bauxite, the, the sort of vehicles, the heavy equipment, the trucks, which Esther was talking about. The main jobs in bauxite are driving these trucks and operating these vehicles. In the 20th century, most bauxite in the world came from open pits in a few places. Initially, Suriname was the largest bauxite producer. Then Jamaica was added. Then after uh, Michael Manley's its efforts to sort of nationalize the industry, it shifted to Guinea, to India, to Australia, and to Brazil. Those were the main places where bauxite was sourced. It was put into this bare aluminum production process, which, as I said, discovered in 1889 or invented, still the process that's used. In these typical depictions of the process, you'll notice there's no workers, there's no context, there's n barely any land. There's the truck, there's the machinery, and then there's this output at the end. But you'll see in little places along the way, there's a little pipe that just sort of sticks out, and it says, mud lake, <laughs> mud lake, right? So remember those four tons of bauxite for every ton of aluminum, it's spewing out of that little pipe here and there in this process into something called the mud lake. And it, this distribution around the world also is a way of visualizing bauxite production that kind of removes it from any physical reality, right? It's a pie chart. We'll, we'll get our slice of the pie, right? And you see South America and the Caribbean is the green, the green slice of pie there, 21% um, of global um, distribution of bauxite resources, as they, they call it. So here's what comes out of the pipe, right? The Red Mud Lake. These are images of Red Mud Lakes in Jamaica. Red mud is the, t is the technical term for this output. It's a waste product from the bare process, which is the first step of turning the bauxite ore into an aluminum oxide. 120 million tons are produced annually. It cannot be easily disposed of. It's pumped into these holding ponds, and it stays there indefinitely drying, right? And as it dries, nothing can grow there, nothing can be done with that land, and dust blows off the surface of it. It coats surrounding leaves and trees and gardens and farms and people and homes and people's lungs. It causes illnesses. And that is just an expected outcome of the process. This is, this is not considered a harm. It's, you know, like Jester said, like maybe there's a nuisance from the dust that gets paid for. So the history going back to where this began in Suriname, this is um, this incredible picture I found in an archive of a 1955 photo of a Joka, that is a Suriname maroon village taken from an Alcoa freighter. This is, imagine the freighter is going up the Suriname River, and it's so huge, and it towers above the shoreline. This is the extractive gaze looking down at the village of the primitive people who industry is coming to, what, lift up into modernity or something like that. Alcoa began mining bauxite in Suriname in 1917. It became the largest global source from the 1940s up to the 1960s. In 1959, the Broco Pondo joint venture between Alcoa and the government of Suriname gave Alcoa exclusive rights to bauxite exploration in exchange for building a massive hydroelectric plant by damming the Suriname River. The Afobaca Dam created the world's largest 600 square mile artificial lake in the heart of Suriname. Floodgates were opened in 1964, gradually filling it in up to 1971 to feed an aluminum smelter with the hydropower. It flooded approximately one half of the Saramaka Maroon territory, forcing 6,000 people to abandon 43 historical villages, destroying their cultural sites and heritage. And you can read more about this in anthropologist Richard Price's series of works, but including Rainforest Warriors, where he looks into how it violated the Maroon treaties um, just as happens in Jamaica with the Akampong Maroons. It forced people into what were called transmigration villages, which had no electricity, that had nothing, despite this huge electric infrastructure having built. And the association um, of Samaka authorities actually took a case to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which they won in 2007, 
but development continues to violate their rights, treaty rights, human rights, ecological rights. It's had no impact. So hydroelectric dams around the world power aluminum smelters and displace people. Not just Afobaca, but the James Bay complex in Canada, which flooded 16,000 square kilometers, affecting Korean Inuit people to power Alcan smelters. The Akosomba Dam built on Ghana's Volta River in 1965, which was, again, the world's largest man-made lake at that point in time, and displaced 84,000 people to power a Kaiser aluminum smelter. The Tucurui Dam in Brazil flooded 3,000 square kilometers of rainforest, displacing 32,000 people in the 1980s, leading to the movement of dam-affected people, the, famous, the murder of the famous activist Dilma Silva, et cetera. So this has been going on for a while. But it's coming back stronger than ever now. This is from that Bloomberg article. This is the map um, in Brazil of where the ships carry bauxite from up river to along the Amazon River from what's called the MRN mine to a huge uh, famous smelter called Alu Norte, the Alu Norte smelter, where it's refined into alumina before being shipped elsewhere. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of the map is Fordlandia, the site of Henry Ford's failed attempt to build a rubber plantation in the 1920s. So still this connection to the auto industry and to um, various kinds of extraction that work together. Um, this is zooming in on a part of that map where the mining is. And what you find is that the um, existing stripped mines and the proposed mine expansion area, as in Jamaica, is next to protected land for the descendants of slaves. That's the, the, this question of these borders and that the so-called expansion area goes into the supposedly protected land. This is happening right now, right? And it's to make our Ford F-150 trucks. So what is extractivism? Extractivism is the exploitation of natural landscapes, living entities, minerals, metals, and energy sources for the benefit of capitalist profit. It's grounded in coloniality. It includes slavery, mining, plantation, agriculture, factory farming, commercial fishing, mega dams, oil drilling, and the general plunder and destruction of the earth. Uh, Macarena Gomez Barris um, talks about extractivism as an economic system that engages in thefts, borrowings, and forced removals, violently reorganizing social life as well as the land by thieving resources from indigenous and Afro-descendant territories. Thank you for that. Extractivism is also an ideology premised on racism, othering, and not caring about the impact of one's actions on others, on the natural world. Extractivism has neither conscience, nor ethics, nor justice. Extractivism constantly moves, using up landscapes and lives, giving back nothing, leaving behind pollution, waste, and poverty as it shifts to the next place. So mining right now, bauxite mining, is expanding not only in Jamaica, as we see in Esther's work, um, also in Haiti, of all places, yes. Haiti is also has been a site of bauxite mining in the past, gold mining, other kinds of mining, and companies are going back there right now, engaging in land grabbing, taking land from peasants, um, and going back to existing mines and opening, trying to open new ones and trying to build infrastructure to help export out. Um, again, this other map shows, the again, this question about these boundaries of where is the, the cockpit country, the protected area, where are the mining leases, and you can see it all overlaps. Um, continuing pollution, um, the... The, uh, this one, Deja Vu, as bauxite company pollutes an iconic Jamaican river yet again. That's from 2021, right? This is not past history. This is ongoing now. Um, the major fire that happened at Jam Jamalco's plant in Clarendon. Um, so people are protesting against this. As Esther told us about, this is one of uh, a still from um, one of the protests of the No Mining and Cockpit Country group. Um, I started finding out about the protest against the industry when I went to the Saving Iceland protest camp in 2007, where there were people from around the world, from South Africa, from India, from Brazil, um, from uh, many different countries who were there working together to try to stop these large-scale extractive industries. Really crucial has been Latin American feminist anti-extractivism. 
Um, Melissa Cabropan Duarte calls for a recognition of the inherent patriarchy of extractivism using an intersectional approach. Um, the feminist Lorena Cab Cabnal, Maya Quecha, introduced the notion of territorio cuerpo tierra, territory body land, emphasizing territorial knowledge and women as epistemic subjects in the movement to defend indigenous lands against mining and mega projects. And Rosalba Icaza examines ecocide as connected to epistemicide and proposes working coalitionally to overcome both. Um, so these, these are the kinds of movements that are building bridges across the Americas, across the world in fighting um, to stop ecocide for aluminum, as this protest banner from Iceland in 2007 put it. And I'll just end by saying, Beyond extractivism, what are the other imaginaries? What else, we said, what, you know, besides a so-called green transition, what is there? There's indigenous maroon and African descendant ontologies based on regenerative economies, circular systems that return energy benefits and care back to those who dwell there rather than always taking out or depleting. There are alternative modes of human and more than human perception of living beings connected through social ecologies of sharing in which we hold and care for others in common and set limits on use. There's attention to future livability, not only for humans, but for all living entities and for the earth, the seas, the rivers, and the atmosphere. And there's recognition that we are all interconnected in a relational web of life as Esther beautifully shows in her film. And I'll stop there, and there's some of the references that I mentioned. Thank you. Go ahead, you come up, I'll just do this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mimi Scheller. And now is the turn of Daniel Nemhar. Um, <coughs> who is an environmental consultant, marine scientist, and climate justice advocate, who specializes in sustainable environmental management. She attained a master in marine biology and ecology after transitioning from nine-year telecom career in the Caribbean and Central America. She has studied the Great Barrier Reef and worked in the Caribbean, Australia, and the Philippines, helping people, communities, and business to build their resilience to disasters and climate change. Daniel was awarded a PhD research scholarship to the Cairns Institute and James Cook University in Australia under the Great Barriers Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. Danielle's uh, research aims to find avenues to decolonize natural resources management and conservation science and to promote traditional knowledge and co-design practices in regional ecosystem-based adaptation programs. Danielle is here by Zoom. Uh, please, Danielle, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me just try to share the screen for a moment. Okay, I I'm hoping everyone can see um, my presentation. Um, thank you again for having me. Gracias por invitarme. I just feel it necessary to point out um, that I am Bilingual, uh, please excuse me a second because I'm not sure. Sorry, what's happening? Here, okay, here we go. Okay, um, right, so I hope to um, focus in a little bit on my uh, PhD research that I'm doing. I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. Um, I see that I am amongst my peers in terms of the sociologists and political scientists and anthropologists. Uh, so thank you again for having me. Um, 
before I begin, I just want to firstly acknowledge that the land where I live and work remains unceded, that is Australia. Um, I acknowledge the Gimoy, Wallabari, Denji, Iriganji, and Jabogaya peoples as the traditional owners of the country where I am meeting you from today. I pay respects to their elders, past, present, and the emerging leaders of tomorrow. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as traditional owners of the land, seas, and waters where I live and my research takes place. And I also would like to extend this acknowledgement to the First Nations peoples of the diverse lands where this conference is being held and transmitted. So thank you again. Um, it's also 3.30 a.m. in the morning where I am, so please bear with me if I sound a little bit um, out of sorts. <clears throat> Um, my research hopefully is going to focus on the process and activities of ecosystem or ecological restoration. Um, at this point, I have not collected any data. So this is primarily a theoretical and conceptual journey that we're going to take together. Um, so in the true spirit of academia, you'll probably leave here with more questions and answers, which is hopefully not a terrible thing. I've also worked in environmental management and consulting and non-governmental organizations, so NGO. Um, I understand the need for um, a lot of the academic work that we do to be real and applicable across these diverse stakeholder groups and situations. And so um, it's my aim that my, my research will take that direction. Um, so I focus in on ecological restoration, which is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, it's applied to a wide range of activities that occur along a continuum from site remediation, which is something that you'll see in a lot of cases where you have um, pollution, toxic waste, mining activities, um, where you're trying to remediate the site um, to a state that it was in prior to being um, damaged or degraded. You have engineered landscapes that occur in, let's say, urban areas, such as a green space or a park. Um, there are attempts to introduce single species or multi-species complex assemblages. So if you take the example of when they reintroduce wolves to uh, Yellowstone, that's considered as a restoration activity. When they look to um, restore kelp on the coast of California um, so that their apex predators didn't decimate the, the ecosystem, um, that's seen as restoration. And there are also attempts to rewild particular landscapes. Um, so the ultimate goal really is to move the ecosystem into a state where it can jumpstart its own recovery and then take over from there as natural processes. Um, many of us are familiar with nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation, natural resource management, and even conservation efforts all invoke ecological restoration as a, a mechanism. Um, <clears throat> projects occur across many scales. They can be local place-based community activities uh, to regional wide um, interventions. They are singular, multi-year, volunteer, multi-institutional partnerships. Sometimes they involve passive and active interventions, biotic and abiotic. Uh, at the moment, Ecological restoration is now deemed a global priority, and this is reflected in the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration being declared, um, which has an ambitious goal to restore over at least 350 million hectares of degraded terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems globally. Um, in the face of the climate crisis um, that is set to outpace conventional restoration efforts, the science and practice of restoration are becoming more sophisticated. Um, they're invoking more technology and they're trying to ramp up their efforts over time and over spatial dimensions. So we're looking at regional um, adaptation, sorry, ecosystem restoration and adaptation. And this is introducing new levels of risk and uncertainty across um, the persons involved in these projects. And one of the examples of scaling up that we're seeing is um, you have geoengineering, for example, that's considered a restoration technique, a hybrid restoration technique. You have the Great Barrier Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which is a program I'm associated with, where they're essentially looking at buying the reef time um, to in its adaptation processes. 
uh, by industrializing the restoration projects. So um, they're taking a very technical and commodified approach. There are patents involved for the different technologies that they're developing uh, to deploy across the reef. Um, it is so restoration is now a salient feature in climate and conservation policies in the inter international arena. Um, basically as a mechanism to not only restore ecological function and conserve biodiversity, but to enhance societal res resilience in the face of inevitable climate extremes. So my perspective, which is shared across um, many spaces, is that without addressing the root causes of ecological degradation, then ecological restoration is unlikely to achieve long-term sustainable outcomes for justice or broader systemic transformations. In this instance, um, the root causes of ecological de degradation are ongoing and pervasive structural inequities and inequalities. So with that being said, I have three main lines of inquiry that I'm looking at um, for my research, which is taking place in a settler state, a settler society, where you have settler colonial logics that are still impacting um, structures of domination that are unfolding in the ecological restoration place, a space, sorry. So I'm looking at power, knowledge, and justice as my three lines of inquiry. Uh, ecological restoration is a very power laden space. It's a practice of power. It's a practice of politics. Um, in most instances, ecological restoration takes place where you have intersections of environmental and social injustice. Um, there are a broad range of affected actors and parties who hold different locations and positions of power. Um, different uh, dimensions of access. You have a select few decision makers. You have corporate and industrial powers at play. You have political and legislation powers at play. Now we know that environmental inequalities, such as exposure to toxic hazards, exposure to mining, exposure to extraction, they're all these are all systemic hazards. Um, and they can amplify or reinforce other social inequalities and divisions, especially as it relates to racial, racialized, sorry, and ethnicized groups, as well as those who are in different socioeconomic classes. So when you look at where extractive um, industries are located, it actually mirrors um, colonial logics as they're usually located in areas where social and economic conditions are most conducive to development largely without challenge. And so those who are impacted by these activities um, usually have fewer means to cope or um, challenge these the, the injustices that they face. Um, so I had the pleasure of working with Esther on the um, cockpit country and bauxite mining uh, projects. When you look at how ecological restoration is leveraged in those instances, um, it's still a part of the larger um, structure of domination where legislation is written in favor of industry while uh, further disenfranchising and marginalizing the communities where mining is taking place and where real injustices are happening. Um, you only have to look at the fish kills again in Rio Cobra and how those instances are remediated who defines what is a risk, who defines what is a benefit. These are all outcomes of power that unfold in the ecological restoration space and are not really engaged with in broader practice. Um, power, sorry, in terms of ecological restoration, in those types of projects when it involves remediation, EIAs, um, management plans, and just overall projects, they make reference to stakeholder engagement which is a very vague and broad term that doesn't actually mean anything. So while I try to outline normative standards and guidelines for what stakeholder engagement should look like, there's really no acknowledgement of the power dynamics that are embedded in the practice of ecological restoration or the intersecting social inequities and environmental injustices and how they basically mutually are mutually constituted to create barriers to engagement, restrict beneficial outcomes, and continuously reproduce harms. Um, I also look at power in the context of knowledge production um, because power is established and reinforced through accepted forms of knowledge, scientific understanding and truth. Power influences what is deemed expert authoritative knowledge, what comprises the foundational elements of our reality. So 
power is going to dictate the knowledge production process and knowledge is going to tell us whether or not this ecosystem is healthy, whether or not this ecosystem is degraded, um, what the risks are that are involved, as I had mentioned before. And in the context of ecological restoration, which is a largely um, Western scientific canon, um, there is very little space created for plural knowledges. Um, so in the context of my research, I'm focusing on indigenous and traditional knowledge of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities here in Australia who have stewarded and exerted their own forms of environmental governance and conservation and restoration over the lands in time memorial. So over 60,000 years of stewardship. And so where you have spaces where these two epistemologies and anthologies meet in the ecological restoration arena, I am interested to know what are the processes that privilege some forms of knowledge over others when there are people who have literally existed on the face of the earth taking care of this um, ecosystem and transmitting this knowledge and curating it and enriching it over generations and generations and generations. And so the landscapes that we see now today are the um, products of historical custodianship and relationships to country that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Australians have. And that is similar to the case that you'll see for other indigenous people um, around the world. And I use the term indigenous people, I'm basically subsuming the plural under the singular, but I'm trying to capture the different experiences of different indigenous people around the world. Um, so in my, sorry, I'm very interested in the co-design and co-production process that takes place in the ecological restoration space, as I said. Um, I'm very interested in interrogating the social configurations that allow some types of knowledge to be deemed as expert and, author and authoritative, while others are disregarded or relegated to the margins. Or in the case of ecological restoration, indigenous knowledge is basically used as an avenue to fill the gaps of Western science and is in many instances tokenized or romanticized um, based on misunderstandings of indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so power and knowledge are also facets of justice. And in this regard, even in, sorry, justice in the way I'm looking at it is that yes, there are pillars of justice and I've, I've deliberately not specified climate or environmental justice because um, justice in this context also remains a product of liberal, of Western liberal frames and thought. And it's a very useful framework to guide our thinking in what constitutes justice in many cases. So how are the risks and benefits dis being distributed? Um, are the processes fair? Are we doing due diligence and due process um, when engaging in decision making? Who is is who's granted the rights and the privilege to represent their interests in the ecological restoration space? And what are some of the structural forces at play that shape the, 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 the playing field where decisions are being? made. Um, but again, this is just one conception of justice, right? And if you're talking about invoking or, or making space for plural perspectives and the relational way of knowing and doing of many Indigenous communities, then perhaps this framework for justice is not necessarily the most applicable um, in, in this context. So my, my research focuses in on the Great Barrier Reef, which is a very complex and large ecosystem. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the, the, the home of 70 plus traditional owner groups um, and over close to 450,000 square kilometers. It is a site where social, cultural, economic, and political interests and scientific and academic also intersect. And so it's again, interesting to see what knowledge is privileged how power is accessed and how power is executed and experienced in this ecological restoration space. So my focus will be on indigenous land and sea management um, programs, which are partnerships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups and um, industry, investors, academia, scientists, et cetera, in um, environmental governance and protection. Um, and in this space, on, along the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and Indigenous land and sea management, you see where um, political, well, legislative processes can 
continue to inflict forms of harm and even violence on uh, indigenous populations as processes to, for example, claim native title rights and become a tradition or be recognized in a settler state as a traditional owner of the reef can inflict harm because it relies on mechanisms that were derived in a settler colonial structure of domination rather than in an indigenous knowledge system and community of reciprocity and relationships. And so you are forced to somehow prove um, your tenure and lineage and ties to your ancestral home by mechanisms that de were derived by people who originally dispossessed and disavowed your existence, basically. Um, so in a nutshell, I, I'm not sure how much time I've taken up. I highly it out upon 15 minutes, but I will wrap it up. Um, my objectives are to use intersectional feminism, decolonial um, scholarship, and um, indigenous justice frameworks to basically deepen our understanding of the webs of power that operate in locally situated ecological restoration and how these are socially differentiated. Um, evoke alternative conception of justice in the social, cultural, and ecological context of ecological restoration. Engage in critical and reflexive analysis of the spaces where relic colonial epistemologies and logics proliferate and in and, and connect with indigenous knowledge systems and how these interact in the space where ecological restoration is taking place and hopefully contribute to the emerging decolonial and anti-colonial scholarship in ecological restoration and broader environmental sociology. Um, thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel Nemhart. Now is the turn of Manuela Pic who also is in Zoom, actually in Ecuador. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science and Sexuality and Women's and Gender Studies at Amherst College, um, professor of international relations at the University Universidad San Francisco de Quito. She's the author of scholarly books and articles, including Vernacular Sovereignties, Indigenous Women Challenging War Politics, published by University of Arizona Press, 20, 20, 2018, and contributes to international media outlets. Her work in the intersections of scholarship, journalism, and activism led to her detention and expulsion from Ecuador in 2015. She was nominated as one of the new generation of public intellectuals, 2018, and featured in the Femen List 100, uh, 20, 000, 2021, of women working in law policy and peace building across the global south. She works for the legal defense of indigenous peoples setting an international legal precedent with her partner, Jaco Perez Guardamel, when the United Nations recognized indigenous rights to autonomous, autonomous marriage in 2022. Please, Manuela, go ahead. Manaja, gracias. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there's a lot of people I haven't seen in a while in the audience. Miguel, saludos. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the defense of the defenders. Um, last week, uh, Eduardo Mengua, who was a co-fan leader and a national representative of CONAIA, which is the National Confederation of Indigenous Peoples of Ecuador, was assassinated in his house uh, by sicarios, uh, very similarly to Berta Cáceres in 2016 in Honduras. And very similarly to her, Eduardo was resisting the re-entry of Petro Ecuador, the national oil company on his territory. He was denouncing that the government was invading the territory, sending the police, that even the governor had, had come with the police to pressure the way of the oil company in. And uh, he's a member of the Kofan nationality in the Northern Amazon of Ecuador. It's the area where oil started in Ecuador. Uh, it's the most contaminated area of the Ecuadorian Amazon. There is an average of one oil leak per day in Ecuador. 
uh, in oil production. And on the Kofan territories, which are relatively small and are the smallest indigenous nation or close to, there are 30 oil wells. Uh, Petro Ecuador entered, was expelled by the community and is trying to re-enter now. He's dividing the community and now sending sicarios to assassinate the, the nature defending, resisting and contesting uh, oil extraction. I bring that because it's the latest uh, assassination of a nature defender in Ecuador, but also because Ecuador is known internationally since 2008 for having integrated the rights of nature in its constitution. Um, so supposedly Ecuador is the, the beautiful paradise for the rights of nature, right? And yet extractive industries have expanded very fast and throughout territories since the rights of nature were inscribed into law. Uh, before the rights of nature were into law, there was no extraction in the Yasuni in the Amazon. Uh, there was no metal mining in the highlands contaminating water springs. And now we have both of those. There is a report from the OAS from 2019, and that is before the pandemic. And we know that mining has expanded after the pandemic. But back then, illegal mining in Ecuador had increased 30% almost and most of it was illegal mining. So most of it is going to China. Uh, Ecuador reported exporting $76 million in gold to China, but China registered uh, entering $340 million of gold from Ecuador. So there's a discrepancy in numbers and we start seeing um, the illegal market taking over the legal extraction as a strategy to prepare the terrain. Uh, back in 2019, in that report, it said that Ecuador exported nearly four times the gold of Colombia and Peru combined to China. Ecuador is a very small country with a very new extraction of gold, and it's mostly in the Amazon. So in that context, last week, after the assassination of Eduardo Mendua, last week, um, the government of Ecuador is in Canada, uh, participating in the world's largest mining fair and announcing that it will create a national mining registry to foster mining concessions and already uh, announced that it will legalize and authorize over 170 mining concessions that are stuck and being held up by lack of prior consultation, environmental standards, etc. All of it without the consent of indigenous peoples, without environmental consultation, any of it. So the idea is that rights of nature alone, strategies for conservation alone, green transitions alone, as the, our, my colleagues have just explained before me, won't do it. We need people on the territories protecting the rivers, the forest, and contesting the entry of uh, extractive industries. So we have to protect the defenders, defend the defenders if we want to actually protect biodiversity and, and slow down if, if we're not able to reverse the sixth extinction and the climate collapse. So first, let me just posit why indigenous peoples are so central to uh, the anti-extractivist struggle. Extractivism is happening on indigenous territories. They are 5% of the world population, according to the United Nations. Yet there are over 40% of the nature defender killed, of reported nature defender killed according to Global Witness. Most of them never make it to the official records. So I estimate that it's at least half of the nature defenders killed in the world who are indigenous people. Uh, many of them are local communities. And extractivism is happening on their territory because those are territories considered empty lands, right? Uh, terra nullius, up for, uh, available for land grab. Indigenous people who are 5% of the world population, they have on their territories 80% of the remaining biodiversity in the world. They safeguard biodiversity, right? So um, the, because indigenous peoples are considered, even though they are new narratives, but they're still largely considered as nobodies, right? Discriminated by racist structures and legal systems that treat them as savages, uh, underdeveloped, blocking development. Their territories are 
uh, modernized through the imposition without consultation of extractive industries. And so they're fighting to defend their territories and the biodiversity on their territories as their only late way of life. It's not like they decide to be nature defenders. They're defending their territories as the only way of life, as the only place of life. And they're putting their lives on the line and on the front lines because they have no alternative choice. And here I want to make a connection between ecocide and genocide because some of us have talked about ecocide before. There's a very fine line between ecocide and genocide because if you destroy the, the territory, the ecosystem a community lives on, you're de facto destroying the community. So it's not a coincidence that since 2016, the International Criminal Court recognizes ecocide as a form of genocide. And there is a big push to try to add ecocide to the list of the four crimes of the International Criminal Court. And of course, it's not just the ecosystem that disappears, it's the knowledge, it's the way of relating to human and beyond human kin. Uh, it's knowledge and memory that goes with the ecosystem that is destroyed by extractive industry. So when indigenous people say water is life, Niwikoni, which was the rallying cry uh, in Standing Rock and is a rallying cry across the world for different indigenous uh, groups, they actually mean it that we are water. We're intrinsically connected to the ecosystems we inhabit, right? So the Maori people, for instance, in the Wanganayu region say, I am the river and the river is me. Their struggle to protect the Waganui River was 160 years, multiple generations. It started under British crown, right? And only, I think in 2016, got recognized. In the Arctic, the indigenous people say, I am the caribou and the caribou is me. But this notion that there is no difference between the human and natural world is central to indigenous worldviews. And I wanted to insist on that because um, when indigenous people defend those worldviews, they are, um, that's really what makes them at risk because they're not just contesting oil, big oil and big mining and all of those billions of dollars, that economy. They're also contesting um, the self arrogated claim of sovereign states to decide what to do with territory, right? So the commodification of life, uh, human life, natural life and territory through the sovereign right to grant concessions to private corporation, right? So they're, they are challenging global capital and the global system, Westphalian system of state sovereignty. So indigenous peoples are being killed because they're going against the two most powerful forces, right? State sovereignty and global capital. So maybe as a last point, what I wanna focus on is that it's not about conservation and it's not about the green transition because it's about consent. Uh, it's about the consent of indigenous peoples and it's about um, reconnecting, restoring our relations as indigenous people say, right? But it's about not separating humans from nature. Uh, all these conservation efforts that are coming, it's extremely scary to see the 30-30 um, and 50-50 projects that are planning to make 30% of the world, uh, to conserve 30% of the world by 2030 and 50% of the world by 2050, because we know very well which territories are going to be enclosed as fortress conservation. It's going to be the territories of local and indigenous communities. So the biodiversity loss is going to continue and the green economy, right? The green capitalism is going to continue in the name of conservation, but based on these colonial premises that indigenous peoples are savages that don't know any better and that we have to help them and that help, that modern help comes in the form of dispossession and intervention. And here I wanna insist that in, in Amazonia in particular, um, the biodiversity is not wilderness, right? It's uh, Now scholars have published abundantly about it, but it's created by humans. So it's a social, social biodiversity. Um, it's the legacy of thousands of years of humans managing the forestry in those territories. So it's not about taking humans out of the forest, right? It's about what kind of humans are relating in which ways with the forest. So um, green economies will continue as the, I, I won't go into it because it's been extendedly discussed already, but we are gonna have lithium for electric cars, continuing the dispossession and the contamination. 
And most importantly, it will continue these life ways of uh, commodification of lives, right? So we're not challenging the way cities are organized, the way social life is organized, and in particular, the way social life is racialized, right? So which territories and bodies are territories of sacrifice, spaces of sacrifice, um, and where can we make the green transition happen? So in that process, because it's about consent, um, in Ecuador, I, that's where I'm studying it more because I'm here and I'm working on various legal cases, but I think it's happening throughout Latin America. It's not really the rights of nature that are leading to the protection of territory. It's rights to prior consultation and consent. So every time judges actually suspend um, mining operation, whether it's oil or metal mining. The Rio Blanco case I've published about it, right? It was, it opened in 2018 and after six months, indigenous communities were able to suspend the metal mine, the concession that already had $80 million invested in the operation because of lack of prior consultation. And there are cases after case of lack of prior consultation leading judges to suspend operations. It's small, it's still the exception, but it's starting to happen in Latin America, which is great news. So since courts are upholding indigenous rights to prior consultation, governments are going after rights to prior consultation, obviously. So now the latest we've seen is that they tell indigenous people that they're not indigenous. So in October, we were in a court hearing for the Kimsekocha Highlands. Uh, which the government has given into concession to a Canadian corporation, which has sold it to a Chinese corporation. And in the courts, uh, are, we won, the communities won, it's the territories that I inhabit. Um, so we won in the first trial. The government appealed together with the corporation, putting all of the judicial machine of the state in defense of the corporation, and is arguing that there are no indigenous peoples in that area. So the, the lawyer of the government literally said, it's not because they speak Quechua, they dress Quechua, and that they have Quechua names that they are indigenous. Verbatim, they said that in court. And three months later, we saw uh, the beginning of a um, national census of population that created for the, that changed the category in the census on who is indigenous and how to identify as indigenous to block them. So a lot of people could not identify with their nationalities, one. Two, that had a registry of indigenous communities. It was called an indigenous census but it was of communities, but it was not a census of indigenous communities. It was a registry of indigenous communities, just like the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the US. And the idea is to make a list of who is indigenous and who is not, very quietly. So that they can say that here in this very community, there's an, in this very small territory, there's an indigenous community, but not in the rest, right? So it's a strategy to protect themselves from further cases of uh, self-determination. And that census is being made, uh, realized with funds from the World Bank. And when the World Bank loans funds to do a census, it imposes the methodology for the questions too. And the president of the Ecuadorian Institute for Census, which, who arrived a year ago, is a former uh, delegate from the World Bank. He moved straight from the World Bank to the, indigenous, to the census of uh, Ecuador's government. So I want to close to make um, three calls for actions. Um, understanding that nature defenders are the number one protectors uh, of our planet's biosphere, and that in times of climate crisis, the only way forward is to work with the defenders and to safeguard their lives, their territories, and, and their ways, their cultures. So the first idea would be first that climate action has COC <laughs> to include human and indigenous rights. And in 2001, the representative of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change asked the UN to fully integrate the rights of indigenous people in climate action in preparation for the COP26. Um, there is no possibility to go forward in climate action without indigenous and human rights because they're being killed uh, like fleas, like flies on the front lines. The second idea, um, the second action would be that international law must be enforced as to require at least the free prior and informed consent of communities, uh, local and indigenous communities for any projects on their territories and their lands. Ideally, we need to have this uh, consent 
mechanisms designed by and with indigenous communities because we're seeing governments now also trying to design their own processes of consultation, knowing that they can manipulate it after unconsulted uh, laws and consultation. And third, we must defend the defenders. And uh, although I have uh, many doubts on the uses of the law, because law is conquest, right? Conquest by law, and dispossession by law, as Vinnie Deloria has written, but yet there are some mechanisms that we can try to put into place. One is the Accords of Escasu, right? The international agreement that requires transparency on uh, extractive projects and that uh, requires government, makes governments responsible for the well-being and the lives of uh, environmental protectors. So defending indigenous lifeways, their territories, is as central as defending biodiversity. They are the guardians of biodiversity and they will be, they are the front lines and they will be our only, the point of the arrow we say in English, uh, for any effort on, on reversing the climate crisis. Thank you, Manuela Pic. Now is the time for Q and A. Um, for the audience, we have um, back lunch lunch bags in the hall, so you can bring your bag and participate in this Q&A section. And the microphones are over there. Questions? Um, I have two questions, one for um, Mimi and one for um, uh, the presentation on lithium. Um, for Mimi, I'm very curious to, um, to learn more about how you see the representations of these technical systems, right? It seems that the way how these systems are, are portrayed and imagined or or explain, right, make invisible many aspects of the process, right? And I think that's part of your argument when you say extractivism is not only what happens on the ground, literally on the ground, but also what happens along the supply chain, right? And I think when we think about extractivism, we tend to think about that practice of extracting something from the soil, from the ground, right? And in part might be a consequence of those technologies that produce imaginaries about how the system function, right? And there is a, there is a, I think there is an interesting question about how those social technical systems are imagined, represented visually or explained in different kind of narratives or debates. And that's why I think it's very interesting how you're using also, let's say, an infographic form press today, right? Kind of showing in a visible way maybe a different part of that system. Those, those figures, those maps can also be considered those kind of social technical construct of, or technologies that produces imaginaries about, about um, uh, extractivism. And I'm just very curious about the, how those technologies make invisible, right? Certain part of the processes and certain um, uh, entities, environmental or human, right? And regarding uh, lithium, um, I'm very curious to learn more about the, the place of this new kind of knowledge production regarding ways to maybe think about lithium extraction uh, in a more environmental way or, or, or knowledge production that is produced locally, right? Relatively locally. Um, um, and how that knowledge can play a role or not in kind of decision-making processes in policy at a local level, right? What we see often is that local knowledge um, have many barriers to be translated into decision-making processes, right? At, in local agencies, in local governments, right? Um, um, yeah, that's it, thank you. to that um, 
argument I was making that the, the production of scientific knowledge is also part of extractivism. And so, for example, we see right now in top research institutions, research, for example, into how can red mud now be recovered to be used for uh, metal extraction. We could get things out of it still. But it's completely divorced from any grounding in the reality of the communities that still live next to the red mud, right, the red mud lakes. And what does it mean to then start a new industrialization process to extract things again from the extracted waste? And the same goes for um, Alcoa and Rio Tinto have combined in a new um, innovation, one of the first new innovations in aluminum smelting since 1886, which is this company called Elysis, which the Canadian government has invested m hundreds of millions of dollars in. To, they've created a new kind of cathode um, and electrolytic bath system that will reduce the carbon output, the CO2, from the aluminum smelting process. And they now claim they've redone the cathodes and the electrolytic bath in a way that the only output will be oxygen. So it will be carbon-free aluminum smelting. But, of course, it ignores the fact that you still need the whole extractive chain, the bauxite mining, everything to go into the smelters, and that they still need electricity. And that although hydropower is considered a green, you know, carbon-free source of electricity, the main, um, the biggest production of aluminum takes place in China, where they're actually coal-fired power plants. So all of this, like, sci the scientific representation of these processes, of the, the, w the technical systems, abstract it from the lived reality. And that's, in a way, why something like Esther's film, I think, is so important to actually speak to the people who are living this reality and find out what their experience is. And then as we see that that constantly is getting denied or erased by the government, and in Manuelo's talk also, this question of indigenous epistemes, knowledge, understanding of their lived experience, how can that be, it's our, our obligation, should be to be able to Ex recognize that knowledge, hear that knowledge, listen to it, right, rather than to always revert to some abstracted technical scientific system. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, two questions here. I think I can, oh, I can reply now. If yes, yeah, sorry, Lucas, I, I forgot your name and I couldn't see you on the screen. <laughs> thank you, Liz. Um, thank you for the question. Um, one main point that I want to make is that these places of knowledge produ production, they already exist. And, and, and that is an externality that is positive already. Whether they have an impact or not uh, in the local decision making, that's, that's another story, I think. And I think the two cases, uh, the one in Jujuy, which is at the provincial level, and the one in Chile, Corfo, uh, can give us some, some different ideas. Uh, to begin with, uh, Corfo uh, and the institute uh, they created, they are big entities, huge uh, organizations, and they, they, can, they have leverage to negotiate with companies, so, something that is uh, very unlikely in the case of Jujuy because they are just a research institute. So being part of Corfo, which is a huge company, mixed company where the public sector, the national government of Chile has, uh, is, is involved, uh, probably uh, uh, makes a difference uh, for the Chilean case. Of course, they are more exposed to corruption. In Chile, corruption scandals involving former presidents uh, uh, were there, and, and they were not in, in the case of the, this is a research institute in, in Jujuy, so I think uh, there are pros and cons there, too. Uh, and the other negative aspect of Corfo and the institute in, in the case of Chile, they are further away from, they are far away from, from the salt flats. Of course, companies are in the salt flats, uh, but the institute is, is less connected than in the case of Jujuy, which is in the province nearby. 
So I think uh, th this, these are some of the positive uh, aspects and negative aspects that I can find uh, very quickly. Uh, we can further discuss it if, if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm Macarena Gomez Varis, and I'm here at Brown University, and I have a question and comment and to engage Danielle. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just going to talk to you and ask you about bioengineering in relationship to the o oceans. We have an ongoing project that's really getting off the ground now with the climatologists and scientists here at Brown, and really having a, a kind of fuller conversation about the problematics and possibilities of top-down solutions in relationship to geoengineering, and especially in relationship to the uh, oceanic. And I know that, you know, the I'm really concerned in thinking with you about the the problems of temporality because, on the one hand, the fakapaka, the fukapaka, the kind of indigenous approaches to country and to seascapes and to coral reefs is a beautiful one and it's fragile and it requires time and yet we have, for, you know, I'll try to shorten this, yet we don't have a lot of time in relationship to some of these questions. So how do we think about time in relationship to some of the restoration, remediations, uh, you know, um, post-extractive models that we're thinking about? and. Um, and how does your research methodology actually address temporality in relationship to, uh, you know, uh, these, these issues of time and planning? Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that question. And it's a really good one and something that I'm also thinking about a lot. And I think the answer, again, lies in embracing alternative pluralisms and worldviews. Um, that are linked to indigenous um, knowledges and tenure. Uh, a lot of times when we think about indigeneity and vulnerability, um, we're not remembering that these are people who have lived on this planet for millennia. And so in terms of resilience um, and adaptability, it's not necessarily environmental change that undermines their vulnerability, but it's the social and political forces that do so. And so my approach is really to try as possible, as best as possible to embrace those pluralistic ways um, of knowing that can account for some of that temporality um, and uncertainty that we are experiencing in terms of the Western scientific um, frameworks. Uh, my methodology is still <laughs> in development. I am one nine months into this PhD, and so everything is unfolding uh, pretty rapidly. But yeah, uncertainty and risk is really a big part of what I'm looking at. Um, and again, how this risk is constructed and perceived and later addressed across these different um, social and political actors and what consequences that has in turn for those who have alternative relationships to the land and sea and, and, and water. So I don't really have an answer for your question. I just want you to know that I'm also thinking about those elements as well. Thank you. Uh, oh, hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason um, Reese Porter. And I'm just first and foremost grateful for all four of the presentations. Also grateful for William and Macarena's beautiful questions. I look forward to talking to them as well. Um, so, hmm, how do I want to start? So, my questions are kind of, okay. And one of, in a little bit of my, I think my dissertation research has a really big hole. And one of the big holes is that I didn't really attend to urban laborers as I was looking at how land reform and indigenous, or how land reform and um, stewardship was taking place um, in different coastal regions in Mexico and the post-revolutionary period. And one of the things that I look at is like the violence of the soap industry. And it's one of the things that's really interesting is you have a lot of rural coconut growers who are protesting the importation of coconuts from other countries, particularly the Philippines, um, from the United States in the context of like imperial US-Philippine relations. 
Um, how, however, you have soap workers in Mexico City, in Guadalajara, actually protesting for the importation of coconuts because factories are closing different times of the year, and they're suffering different forms of inequality, marginalization, and lack of just basic needs. So I was just wondering, it makes me think of also just kind of the lack of attention to kind of indigenous struggle, values, experiences in urban areas in Latin America? Because I was just wondering, are there any like educational programs that you guys know of in urban areas in Latin America that are really trying to teach the values of different perspectives of, you know, um, of, of the, the various epistemologies and experiences that are rooted in sites of extraction across Latin America? Because I think that's a big gap or a big question in terms of like how are, how is, how are, in terms of the industrialization, industrialization isn't always just batteries in the global north. Oftentimes, it's different forms of industrialization in, in urban areas as well. And I was just wondering if they're at odds. Um, I have two more questions, but I'm only going to ask one. Maybe I'll have a follow-up later. Um, I loved all of the attendance to better understanding our relationships with extraction through understanding different indigenous epistemologies and ways of relating to nature. And it makes me wonder, especially because I, you know, in studying agrarian reform, you see all the intramural, intercommunity kind of issues that come up: colorism, patriarchy, you know, who gets what land, this, that, and the third. I'll, not to not to problematize the question, but I was just, you know, the the I was wondering what can we learn about how to relate to one another, how to how, how consumption, how can we learn about you know from 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 these communities as well, in addition to just how to relate to nature or how to relate to extraction. How can we learn how to relate to one another? Because one of the things I see most prevalent in looking closely at how claims for land are made and how they're then dealt with within a community is that that's not the end of the conversation, you know, and I think that's one of the one of the tough but beautiful things about struggle is that, you know, we might not see the end of capitalism and white supremacy and colonial present in our lifetime, but we can deal with those intramural um, issues um, that we face um, every day. Thank you so much again for your for your time and presentations. An additional question. This is a question for Manuela. Thank you so much for that very informative presentation. I was really struck by that uh, gold figures number that you gave, and I wondered about the exportation of gold. And I wondered how much of that is actually mixed gold from all of Amazonia being smelted and collected and then exported from Ecuador, and if there's any good data about that. That's a good question. I just read the report two days ago, but I didn't read all of it. I'm going to check how they get their numbers. Part of the problem is how they get their numbers. Um, there might be some of that happening. I just don't know why there would be why they would be exported to China through Ecuador. Um, what I did hear from colleagues who do GIS, like uh, ecologists who work on GIS in the Yasuni, the director of the Yasuni Tiputini station that we have at USFQ, told me last week that the, lay, the last images they have is the level of illegal mining by the rivers in the Amazon is much worse than what's happening in, in Peru. And they're extremely scared because it's not being covered. And we know in the highlands, um, the south of the Cotopaxi, in um, the Yanganates, it's a protected national park. And we know there is extractivism happening. It's a very isolated area up the mountains. Um, we know through sources I cannot cite for the protection of the people who told us. But we know that they're flying into uh, helicopters. There are very few helicopters in Ecuador but they're flying in through helicopters to do the business there. And the other thing that's very worrisome is that there is this connection between illegal mining and narco-trafficking, right? It's one more illicit economy. And Ecuador has been kind of protected from narco-politics until recently. The last two years it exploded, and, and the last two years we've seen the exploded explosion of mining. and. We don't know the factor yet, but it, there is probably a correlation between these two. So I, I'll look into it. Thank you for putting it onto the table. 
Okay, thank you very much. We are very grateful for your presentations, you all. And also... Oh, which question? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's a pending, yes, sorry. Could there is I, a pending question for... I can ask, let me ask another question. Okay. Let me ask another, I'll just start afresh. This is a quick one. So in all the conversation about listening to indigenous communities and what they have to teach us, how do we attend to the stories that aren't for us, that aren't for us to be shared, aren't to be shared for other peoples, and aren't necessarily for the global issue of climate change, but they are for those particular localities? Can, I wanted to make one response, actually, to your, er, your earlier question, which is to say, I mean, in a way, there's an implication there that we are romanticizing, right, indigenous ways of life as somehow, you know, idyllic and that we need to return to that. And, and one thing I just want to add to that is when we talk about indigeneity, it's also important in Latin America and the Caribbean as we have done in these conversations to talk about maroon and Afro-descendant and emancipated uh, populations, peoples, and that the many ways across the Americas, people in resistance have created cultures and ways of life that are not necessarily like deeply indigenous, but they're resistant to capitalism and they're resistant to the commodification of humans, of people, if through enslavement, and to the commodification of land. So forms of family land, of um, heirs land, of what's called laku in Creole, are forms that are resistant to commodification and that allow for mobility of people between urban areas and back to rural areas. There's back and forth movement and people in urban areas are often supporting people in rural areas or rural people are the ones who are displaced to urban areas and reconstitute themselves through these modes. So that's just to say that it's not necessarily to romanticize some ancient way of life, but to say that there's always a reinvention and a an, um, kind of creolization happening of forms of resistance to capitalism that is both indigenous and African and um, Afro-Caribbean. So I want to say a point on that and building up um, on that argument, right? Because it's very important not to romanticize indigenous politics. They're full of corruption and violence too. <laughs> um, and yet indigeneity, so to go back to your point, um, the point of Maroon communities, in a lot of Latin American Maroon communities called in English, which are called Palenques and um, Quilombos in Brazil, are considered indigenous, like so in Colombia, legally indigenous community, indigenous territories and territories are what we call in English indigenous or Afro maroon communities, right? So it's really, indigeneity is really a political identity of resistance. And we, you can go back to Jeff Corntassel, for instance, on being indigenous, which is a great text. Um, I have a book forthcoming with Andrew Canessa called The Savage and the Citizen about that, but it's a political identity of resistance that indicates the passage of the state, and it's a resistance to in defense of territory with all the problems that may exist within indigenous worlds and relations, uh, and one that is based on the non-commodification of life with all the violence that may exist within indigenous communities too, right? But it's not based on the capitalist extraction of life, commodification of life in global markets. And so in that sense, uh, to go back to your original question, right, the, um, which knowledges are to be consumed or exported or diffused um, in non-indigenous worlds and communities, I think these uh, relations to the non-human world and the relation to nature and considering ourselves as part of nature is something that indigenous elders and thinkers and truth tellers have been saying time and again, please take that knowledge. We want you to take that knowledge, right? If there are knowledges we do not, that are not uh, for grabs, this one is a form of relating that we want to be spread way beyond our communities and territories. And uh, just to add to what Manuela said, which was very thorough, simply, 
recognizing and respecting epistemic authority and sovereignty and self-determination is also about data and data sharing. And so we have to inevitably and invariably listen with the eyes, the ears, the mind, all of it to what's being said and not said in those instances and just respect the epistemic authority of those who have decided to share or not share um, and take it from there. Because as you said, not every story is for everyone to tell. Thank you guys very much for those responses. I think I asked my first two questions very poorly because uh, I didn't mean to romanticize these groups. In fact, I was trying to ask, in addition to their relate, like conversations or relations with nature, how can we learn different, how we relate to one another? So what are the intercommunal? So I, was, I wasn't trying, I was saying the complete opposite of romanticization. I was saying, what can we learn from those struggles that we have in our communities now? And I also think my second question about, I appreciate the attendance to Afro-Indigeneity, and I'd also like to say indigenous isn't something that's, as indigenous people live everywhere, in Africa and Southeast Asia. So I think the connecting the indigeneity to, to this kind of this, this hemisphere, the, the Western hemisphere, is something that's particular to the United States or Latin America is very problematic. I think the UN's 5% people are indigenous, I thought I'm very problematic because I feel like there are indigenous people around the world. Um, that might not attend or not be figured in, all, all in that number. But I, I think my other question was about how is this reflected in large urban areas within Latin America, which I, I still, that educational program, which I'm, I, I guess that might have, I don't, I, I'm, I just think I asked my questions poorly. So I, my apologies. But thank you again for the responses. So, uh, you didn't ask poorly, we, I didn't answer your question. So I only have one example for you. Uh, indigeneity is very urban across Latin America. So for instance, in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, you have the Maracana, uh, indigenous communities defending territory there. Uh, in Ecuador, the only such effort that I know on what you're asking is a, a place called Omaere. Um, I'll write it on the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat. Uh, it's in Puyo. Puyo is a small town, but it's a city in the Amazon of Ecuador. And it's Shuar um, women who have created kind of um, um, a huge garden. I think it's three hectares in the city to teach young generations of Shuar people who are young about the plants and the knowledge that comes with the plants and medicine so that they, they migrate to cities, but they don't forget about those knowledges that come with their language. That's the only such effort I know in urban areas. Beyond that, it's only linguistic uh, schools and institutes like the Quechua, um, Academia Quechua de Letras, <laughs> Quechua Academy of Arts or Letters, it would be in Quito. Thank you to all our presenters and our audience to, for taking this time for this so important uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.